Hi, welcome back to Toronto Sky. This episode covers from January 3rd to January 13th, 2014. The main focus of this episode is January 9th, starting at 9 a.m. with the sunrise and concluding with the beginning of the sunset the same day. We begin the day with three flights in the middle of your screen, mostly going left to right and a fourth at the bottom of the screen. Zooming out, take notice of the horizon over Lake Ontario. All those clouds will later roll in. At this point in the day, the Toronto skyline is pretty clear. The aircraft appear to be emitting what we would consider contrails, condensation trails that dissipate quickly. However, as you'll see later in the day, these turn into persistent contrails, or chemtrails, as they are more commonly known. It must be concluded at this time that these aircraft are flying at very high altitudes, as zooming in as closely as possible does not actually distinguish a particular type of aircraft. Moving forward to 2.30 in the afternoon the same day, the clouds have rolled in off Lake Ontario, and as we zoom in closely, persistent contrails or chemtrails are visible, many layers of them. Here we have the continuation of spraying at high altitudes. Close observation of specific lines in the sky will show that they gradually expand over time, soaking up the moisture from the surrounding air. At this point in the day, the casual observer would notice absolutely nothing unusual in their daytime sky. Without close observation, it just looks like a regular day. Moving forward the same day at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, the large cumulus clouds observed earlier are now gone with the exception of some very small ones and they also will slowly be absorbed into the artificial chemtrail mass. Also at this time you can start to notice the rainbow effect to the right of the CN Tower. This is known as a sun dog or in some communities a chem dog. The skyline now looks to be what would be described as SRM, or Solar Radiation Management, with most of the chemtrails focusing on blocking out the sun. The video will now focus in on this particular line. It's being sprayed in front of us as I speak, and an interesting thing occurs. This one is actually a persistent and a non-persistent condensation trail at the same time. I assume this is not due to wind as the line stays straight. However, as it reaches into the higher levels of atmosphere, it does disappear, whereas the lower levels continue to persist. I think this is due to the fact that this is where the large cumulus clouds were located and it is soaking up all that water vapor. This next aircraft appears to be at a slightly lower altitude as you can start to distinguish some of the plane-like characteristics. Its plume is quite large, however, it is a non-persistent contrail. Perhaps this is due to the fact that it's at a different altitude, or perhaps the components of the exhaust from this particular aircraft are of a different nature than the others in the sky.
Moving our attention back to earlier flight paths, we can see the results. The sky is becoming more and more milky white. The result is a hazing of the sun, and the air pollution is what causes global dimming. Here we can see that persistent contrail still holding on there. It's being blown from right to left on your screen, but uh, is holding its shape for the most part. As you focus in, we'll see that it really does start to take on the appearance of a natural cloud in its fluffy details. Now looking at the sun, we can see that it's starting to warp slightly and you can distinctly see the sun dog. These fine metallic particles are reflective and they act as a sort of prism. It's a similar effect to what happens when we see the famous double rainbow. Shifting focus on the other horizon, we see that uh, pilots are still hard at work horizon horizon sprang and it is now fully persistent. Here as we zoom in you can clearly make out the fact that this is an aircraft laying down a trail in the sky. So it must be concluded that uh, it is flying at a much lower altitude than the sightings we had earlier in the day. And back again one more time to that persistent contrail we were watching earlier. It's now shifted right across the horizon and still holding on. Quite often when observing this type of phenomenon you may see parallel wave lines in the sky similar to that of a ripple effect you'd see in a pond. These are officially known as altostratus undulatus. Also, in some communities, these are referred to as scalar waves. Among the many applications of scalar waves is the wireless transmission of electrical energy. This is generally where we deviate from specifically solar radiation management and we start to discuss how it's possible to weaponize weather. Originally scalar waves were discussed by Nikola Tesla in the early 1900s. More recently Bernard Eastland on August 11, 1987 filed patent 4686605 -605, method and apparatus for altering a region in the Earth's atmosphere, ionosphere and or magnetosphere. This patent relates to the HARP program in Alaska. The HARP patent includes a proposal to release large clouds of barium in order to increase electron precipitation. The HARP program is not alone in global ionospheric heaters. There seem to be many all over the planet. The HARP program is a complicated topic. It includes plasma physics and nanotechnologies. Originally, a joint project between the University of Alaska and the United States Navy, it was shut down in May of last year. Now it's run exclusively by DARPA. Originally said to only observe the ionosphere and not interact with it, this was contradicted by a release made in February of 2013. U.S. Naval Research Laboratory research physicists and engineers from the Plasma Physics Division working at the High Frequency Active Arroyo Research Program Transmitter Facility successfully produced a sustained high-density plasma cloud in Earth's upper atmosphere. Previous artificial plasma density clouds have lifetimes of only 10 minutes or less. This high-density plasma ball was sustained over one hour by the HARP transmissions and was extinguished only after the termination of the HARP radio beam. This is our final shot of January 9th.
Moving on now to the day after. This is the 10th of January 2014 and we had thick fog for the full day. The day after that, January 11th, 2014, then we still had thick fog. This is actually cleared up. The earlier in the day, the fog actually reached underneath the bridge all the way to the floor of the Don Valley Parkway. And moving on to some pictures of the final day on this video, January 13th, 2014. We see mixed among the large cumulus clouds, we have some evidence of air traffic. Now whether or not you prescribe to the idea that this is being done on purpose or if it is just a byproduct of air travel, one thing's for sure, this is acting as solar radiation management. It is blocking out the sun, depleting your vitamin D intake. In September of 2009, the Royal Society published a report called Geoengineering the Climate, Science, Governance, and Uncertainty. Ironically, this non-governmental organization joined with two other NGOs, the Environmental Defense Fund and the World Academy of Sciences, to write another paper in March of 2010 called Solar Radiation Management, the Governance of Research. Both these papers are available online and are definitely worth a look. If you'd like more information on this subject, a good place to start would be to Google Jim Lee or Dutch Sense, D-U-T-C-H-S-I-N-S-E. Both of these gentlemen have been studying the topic for years now, and they do have many corresponding links to information pertinent to this topic. Also check out geoengineering.org. Thanks for watching.